is the question and answer um, button for your questions. What we're going to do is go through the three presentations together at the start, and we will go through the questions and answers after just to ensure that no one gets cut off. Um, if you do have a general comment that you want to submit to the chat, please feel free, but let's keep all questions to the Q&A feature so that we can keep some order and make sure we cover everything. If your question isn't answered in the allotted time, um, it will be recorded and answered through the Whova platform after. Um, if anyone has any technical issues, please reach out to San Cannon um, through the Whova app or um, directly through Zoom and um, San can help you with that. So I want to get started by introducing the first speaker, which is Jasmine Kirby, who is the Instruction and Engagement Librarian at Carnegie Mellon University in Qatar. Her research areas include digital humanities, data literacy instruction, and digital preservation. So take it away, Jasmine. All right. Share my screen. Sorry. Um, oh, sorry. There you go. Hello, uh, so my presentation is The Cat's Out the Bag and We're the Cat Ladies, the library's role when researchers wanna use leaked data sets. So today I'll be talking about what is leaked data, what factors make working with leaked data particularly ethically tricky, what's the role of libraries, questions to ask your researchers, and leaked data research examples and alternatives. So for the purpose of presentation, what, what is leaked data now? So this is data that's been collected and taken out of its original context and is now available to more audiences and purposes than originally intended. So usually stolen. Uh, this is different than like data that was illegally collected, like those spyware experiments where they collect things that are people are doing on the internet without them knowing. So we're focusing here more on things that people knew were being collected, but we'll get into that and <laughs> had a legitimate purpose, but now is being changed and it's also related to concepts like whistleblowing and uh, getting confidential information into the public without official authorization. Uh, the fields this is most relevant to are cybersecurity, political science, criminology, and internet research. So in a, general the idea is that you use leaked data to see get a view or like a more authentic view of what people are doing since they don't expect to be recorded or watched so that you'll see what they would really do if they thought no one was watching. But wait, you may ask, aren't leaked data sets public information? So first of all, what is considered public is complicated. So for example, there's, um, there was a controversial case where a newspaper created a map of where all the gun owners lived and the gun owners were not happy about this even though that information was technically public. And in general, there's concepts like public figure, which has been really confusing in the world of social media and other like aspects like this that make even defining what is public and what is private more complex. And just because you can find something on the internet doesn't mean that someone meant for it to be public. So website users, they, they didn't thought that, so often they think that things are somehow private, even if they aren't. Study after study has shown that most people do not read, let alone understand the website's terms and conditions or how much of their data is available online. And then of course there's third parties that may be captured in the data that can make things even more complicated. For example, you're probably out here in pictures that your friends have taken or your numbers have been shared with social media companies, even if you don't necessarily use those services. Uh, informed consent and internet research. Researchers definitely need to talk to their institutional review board and not assume that it's a public text available online. Uh, typically for a big data set that you're working with, you're supposed to check with the terms of service of the website or the website moderators or administrators to see if you could collect data, since that is way more straightforward than trying to ask each individual person and makes it actually possible to do this kind of research as well. But there's still like controversy over whether terms of service is enough, the same as informed consent. And even in cases where they actually did go and ask people such as the Lifeline's uh, biobank example, uh, people don't, even when they sat down and talked to them about, you know, and gave them information about how they're, what was being collected and what was used, Later on, when they when researchers asked, like, "Oh, what do you, what did you guys sign up for?" They don't remember, and 
also researchers and participants may not understand fully how the technology they're using in the research works. Similarly, there's the issue of linked data sets. So looking at the biobank again, people said that they didn't want to do it because they were worried about their data being leaked and used for reasons they did not agree to, even though also the people who were in the biobank weren't totally sure what they'd agreed to. And trying to obtain informed consent from internet subjects can create more privacy problems since you have to confirm that accounts belong to people and that identifies them in a way that might not have. As well as talking to IRB members, studies have found that they're worried about indirect identifiers that can inevitably, now that de-identifying things has gotten a lot easier so you could actually identify people through a lot less than before. So linking has been a big issue as well. And of course, anonymity in research has limits, even though a lot of people like to promise to their IRB or ethics board uh, that they'll make keep data private, keep data anonymous, it's actually quite difficult. And there are a lot of exceptions, for example, um, mandatory reporters uh, having to report most countries have laws where if you see someone planning a crime, you have to report it. And there's extra issues with knowing if you see anything, you need to plan ahead so you know, like, okay, this data is from 10 years ago. Do I still have to report a crime that I see in here? As well as um, un we don't know what's coming next and technological change and advancement can make data that you didn't think was gonna be usable in one way more usable later on. Course, and of course, with leaked data in particular, there's ethical concerns about making leaked data easier to use. Um, say having it published might increase awareness that the data was leaked in the first place. And if someone wants to use leaked data for nefarious purposes, most attacks online are technologically simple. So it does not take a lot to cause damage, unfortunately. And of course, there are also researcher safety concerns, as I mentioned before. Um, people don't always, even with publicly available data, they're not always happy about it being reused, let alone with leaked data. And if you figure out who the researchers are, and depending on what the subject is, if it's something you're researching with leaked data because it's hard to get um, direct information about, such as like crime, you don't want criminals coming after you and they might targeting you and your team as well as if it's something like crime, you need to, the content might be disturbing as well. And this of course is all assuming that the information is just challenging to verify and not blatant lies. Cause you can learn a lot from these data sets but there are things you can't learn. So people not using their real names, real genders, or as uh, the famous meme says, as Abraham Lincoln once said, ever, <laughs> Not everything you read on the internet is true, as well as the fact that, so yeah, we don't always know why data was leaked and you have to think about that and what, what was the purpose of sharing all of this and what, who shared it and why, as long, along with uh, people are getting smarter as time goes on about what they put on the internet. So how authentic or how much of the actual um, human experience you're capturing here that's not mediated through this is still up for a question. You still need to think about that as well. Library considerations. Why the library? So people check in with us as they're starting research. Uh, research believes that they're, they should be the ones to decide if their conduct is ethical, but they might not be aware of all the issues. And we're in a good place to tell them about some of these issues as well as to remind them to actually talk about what they did to con conduct their research ethically, which not all researchers do. We also encourage our researchers to be good data stewards and create replicable results. And we direct our researchers to relevant resources. Uh, we're also familiar with uh, related types of research to leaked data sets. So a lot of the same issues that apply to leaked data sets can also be found in medical data, qualitative data, such as long form audio recording, social media research and the controversy there around informed consent, similarly with web scraping and we working with vulnerable populations. And of course, data storage remains a challenge, but a lot of researchers aren't even aware that data storage for something like a leaked data set might even be possible. So talking about how they're gonna manage their data, keep it safe, um, 
actually do things to de-identify, figure out where it can be stored, like in, if there are repositories, which they're not a lot, but they do exist and doing a lot of, you know, making the data useful and keeping their research replicable. Uh, resources to refer your researchers. So of course we should tell them, remind them again and again, please talk to your institutional review boards or equivalent ethics boards for all of you in Europe. So although the problem is, of course, research ethics board members don't always have the technological or background, a skill or background necessarily to tell. That's what some cybersecurity researchers have found on the IRBs and cybersecurity research, as well as the big problem with leaked data is that the biggest thing that IRBs are worried about with any data that's generated in internet research is that it'll get leaked and that it, so, or that, you know, sensitive information will be collected and similar is issues to what you're dealing with with leaked data. So that's something else to keep, you know, in mind, like that's going to be a challenge that they're going to need to work around. Um, there are ethics guidelines. There's what well, some listed here as well as, so the Association of Internet Researchers just updated their guidelines as well. And professional societies for disciplines where leaked data research might um, have looked into some of these issues and published white papers. So I use the political science one as well. Um, another big issue to get across to people interested in leaked data research is that there are too many laws. <laughs> in fact, I mean, like, it's it's good that there are laws. It's just there's a lot of different laws that they're going to be up against if they want to use this type of data. And they should talk to university council or equivalent legal help, though a lot of them will be like, but university council is not going to let me do what I want. It's like, this is why, though, <laughs> because there are a lot of different things, whether it's intellectual property laws, since not if it's from outside the US, uh, the data might actually be copyrightable. There are privacy laws such as general data protection regulation or law around informed consent in the US. There's this issue of trade secrets, which is if you reveal the inner workings of a company and then uh, you can figure out more about it than they meant, <laughs> that becomes an issue. Uh, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which sometimes applies to web scraping and sometimes doesn't, we're still figuring it out. And data breach, like if you found leaked data, and it hasn't been announced yet. The notification laws vary state to state. So it's a lot of, lot of different things. Okay, we tackled the major issues that come with leaked data sets. And you may be wondering, wow, this seems like a bad idea. So the questions to ask researchers interested in studying data leaks include, so I based this off of um, Project Vidal's like web scraping guidelines. It's like, have you talked to relevant university stakeholders? Uh, do you plan, how do you plan on minimizing harm to the original data creator, the data subjects, and yourself and your team as you work with this data? Like who are the data subjects? Or do any of them have stricter data protections? Um, is this a, any type of special data like medical records? Do you know who has the copyright? Um, do they know that the data has been leaked? <laughs> and if so, who's gonna tell them? You know, do you plan on checking to see if it's accurate? and? How is, if it's not accurate, how does that affect your research? Or, you know, this, is this really the best way? So it can be done. Research with leaked data can be done. So we had a researcher here who wanted to study how people create passwords and the IRB approved it, but the researchers had to make sure that the, the data they used that came from this leak was stored very well. They didn't further share it. They couldn't name the bank because this was from a, a bank. And they had to couldn't make just do everything in their power to not make it easier to, for people to figure out uh, which people got leaked. And they did verify the information because apparently they told people they were studying this, and people went up to them and asked, "Like, hey, um, was I part of this?" So I still don't know if they needed to use this data set. It's probably more convenient than going out and collecting all of this individually. But I don't see this as like a huge ethical problem. But again, it's like we can we can fight over this in question time. Um, I think we should move toward participant-centered research on an unexpected, so participants in health, this is looking at biobanks and health uh, data research. People, participants often who do take part in these studies want their data to be shared um, and they assume that's happening. They, they want 
they have concerns about confidentiality and secondary use, but they trust the research process and institutions. And it's like they, they want to go through the process of informed consent and know what's going on, even if they don't totally understand what's going on. And the idea for, and part of the idea for solving that problem with health research was to give them more options for privacy, personalized information about their health based on the data, and seeing them less as subjects and more as research collaborators. So one this is all right, one minute. So one model of working with leaked data, another one is, is specifically is the Have I Been Pwned website, which you're probably familiar with, created by Trey Hunt. And while this works with leaked data, um, it allows, it provides a service that lets people check to see if they've, their data is in a breach and it allows people to opt out of this service. Another example I think that's applicable is the Is My Phone Hacked study that came out of New York. Um, Cornell and what they, uh, researchers provided IT analysis to victims of intimate partner violence. So they were studying how perpetrators use violence, of violence use technology, but as part of the study, they also gave back by helping victims improve the security on their devices. So conclusion, I say never say never. I think we should discourage researchers from working with leaked data because it's just all, there's so many different issues and informed consent is not happening there. Uh, in a lot of cases, I'm not sure that using dubious data is more useful than just asking people directly, though I also have lived through the Trump years and understand you might have to rely on whistleblowers to even get this kind of accurate data and emphasizes that making sure the, the benefits to participants outweigh the risk, but definitely ask people, <laughs> ask again, like what people are doing, why, if they've really thought this through and that this should not be a like a plan A of research or the only way of going about it was through using leaked data. So yeah, that's my conclusion. Here's some work cited and I will, how, Thank you so over much. time. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, you're good. Thanks so much. That was a really interesting presentation. And again, if you have any questions, please throw them in the Q&A and we'll get to them after the three presentations. Um, next up, we have Oliver Vatler, who is a senior researcher at GISAS, the Leibniz Institute for the Social Sciences, where he works in the area of research data management and data acquisition. Um, he consults on projects um, on organizational and legal matters of research data management and heads the data services projects. Oliver holds a master's degree in history and political science. Um, he publishes in the areas of research data management and data protection. So Oliver, take it away. Thanks, I'm just trying to find my, it worked on the first take. Let's see where the presentation is. Sorry about this, should be here. We see a black screen right now. I see a black screen, that's bad. Sorry, sorry to... holding you up again now, like in the rehearsal session. We have buffer time for this. <laughs> Sorry about this. <sighs> oh yeah, um, there's a note from Paula in the chat that presenting with speaker notes hasn't worked for others, um, if that's the issue. That's kind. Of, that's okay. That's kind of strange, because I cannot open my my PowerPoint. Just a second. Sorry. Oop. Um, Will is suggesting to try it as a PDF if you want to save as a PDF. 
um, Oliver, while you explore that, um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> perhaps we can address the one question we do have for Jasmine. Jasmine, if you're still there and want to um, do that. Okay, um, so Lawrence asked, is there an experience issue here? I've had a case where DMPs from master's students identified leaked data they wanted to use, um, WikiLeaks, for example. Also not leaked data, but some other cases where master's students wanted to scrape social media data from things like Facebook groups. The kind of thing, oop. <laughs> <laughs> a good oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it, that works. Um, a good supervisor okay. will hopefully flag, but sometimes gets overlooked. Um, do you want to address that, Jasmine? Uh, sure. Basically, yeah, it's, and I think it's also um, both experience and also people that don't like know that much about internet research or even know that this is an, an issue. Like, I think there's a lot of like misconceptions out there that it's like, oh, social media, it's out there. You can do whatever it's in the it's free it's public and it's that's not getting that working with these researchers and getting it across and getting across to faculty as well it's like no you you need to check on that it's because a lot of faculty just don't know i don't know if that's the someone raised their hand all right Okay, so um, <laughs> okay, the wrong button was hit. Um, Lawrence, if there's a follow up, please feel free to put it in the Q and A. And um, Oliver, your slides are showing now, so thanks for that answer, Jasmine, um, and for being flexible with the the questions right after. Um, Oliver, yeah. do you want to start? Okay, <clears throat> yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, my presentation is going quite kind of like in the same direction uh, as Jasmine's, uh, and I'm uh, tackling a. a small issue here and that is the the terms of services that jasmine also uh, mentioned and um, what we are facing like a lot of repositories uh, and data archives around the globe is that uh, more and more digital trace trace data is coming in so uh, people have been using the internet to collect data in various ways and uh, now it's landing on our doorsteps Mm, part of Gezes is a data archive and we're part of SESTA. So um, we're looking at this and there's an ongoing uh, ethical discussion, uh, Jasmine also mentioned. Um, and uh, there's also some theorizing discussion about like how to handle uh, digital trace data uh, that comes in various shapes and forms. And um, for example, Eck and Kreisberg have, have theorized about this, and they also mentioned the terms of service uh, of the, the platforms that people uh, approach to, to scrape or uh, download data, but they are not looking so much at the, the legal perspective here. Um, and um, the point is that it's, it's central to well, I mean, when we are like at the end of the food chain, we are facing data uh, that needs to be preserved and, and published, uh, then we actually have to know what the terms of service looks, looked like in the first place. So um, the question here is like, uh, do we have or do researchers have to obey this or can we kind of like ban the terms of services that were in place when the data was collected because they are so strict? And as Jasmine also said, like uh, most people don't really know, and a lot of people don't read the terms of service or other contractual issues. Um, but uh, so if we, if I talk from a, a data archive perspective, we have kind of like to re-engineer the way the data came about and uh, look at what the legal issues are here. And I'm looking a bit on the, the German and the US American side. Uh, I'm not a legal expert, I'm not a lawyer, so uh, this is no legal advice. Talk to your lawyer, please. Uh, I've just taken these two examples to show like very different uh, legal contexts or legal systems, but uh, they approach this uh, the term of service uh, issue in a very similar way. So terms of service, there are various terms that you can use for this. Uh, but uh, as Bremen Lee say in their paper, the, the internet has not fundamentally changed the principle of contract. So um, terms of service, actually, uh, they do um, they are the basis of contracts between users and platforms. 
And we can distinguish between two types of, of licenses here, the so-called click wrap and browse wrap licenses. So the browse wrap licenses is the licenses that I mentioned somewhere at the bottom of a website. You go over the website, you, you surf the website. Um, you're probably not really bound by these terms of services, but they might include things like do not scrape or do, do not use any content from this website. Um, more legally binding are the so-called click wrap uh, licenses. This is, these are the licenses that you all know from software uh, installations or uh, if well, you're probably a member of more than one social media platform. So uh, you actually have to actively confirm to the terms of service by clicking uh, on a button. And um, so um, there's no proceeding further down uh, the line without this aff uh, affirmation. Uh, and the terms are not really hidden. I mean, they are shown to you someplace, probably a lot of text, but uh, you have to actively uh, agree. And uh, on the other side, the other term I'm using digital trace data, that's very broad. That can be, I mean, the most prominent uh, example are tweets, but it can be anything from uh, public websites, blog uh, postings, anything you post on Instagram on every, any platform you like. So very broad digital data that's, that was, as in your case, Jasmine, probably not intended to be uh, put someplace for research. And um, the terms of service, if we look at them, they are kind of a conundrum because on the one hand, they, they were meant to facilitate uh, business commercial agreements because they list all the, uh, all the terms quite lengthy everything that usually would go into a contract, but they are not negotiable. So you cannot like revisit Facebook or Twitter and say like, um, I don't like this, can we change it? Uh, and uh, they are open to kind of like, let's, let's say legal traps in quotation marks. And then Turini and colleagues have, have gone over like some 50 uh, web page terms of services and they find, for example, an average of three binding documents per page. So it's not only like one page. Uh, you've got a lot of uh, legal language and technical terminology. So even if you uh, want to go over it and, and try to understand what's going on, uh, it, it's probably uh, some very burdensome. Um, some information might be missing or it's hidden someplace. And um, a lot of the, the websites, they don't tell their users what else they do with the data or that they, for example, monitor the content of users. And uh, this has led, for example, the European Union uh, to to draw or to to pass a, a directive on unfair terms of consumer contracts. So these are only binding in in uh, the uh, EU, but they've gone after this, and a lot of, for example, European countries have uh, passed laws that prohibit uh, this this kind of um, contractual or terms of service. But as we all know, uh, social media platforms, for example, they still use it. Uh, you will still you venture over lengthy documents and you probably don't understand anything. And uh, this is what Ober and uh, uh, Hirsch also find that a lot of people, they, they will just click OK. They will go just agree to anything that's that's available. And um, but the, the problem is, uh, are terms of service a contract? Yes and contracts are binding. So you might not agree with, a, with certain things in your Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, other terms of service, but um, you've agreed to them. And it's a take it or leave it situation, which is, uh, yeah, it's sad, but it's true. Uh, and it's this, it, it's true for the United States. As I mentioned, the click wrap uh, license, as in Germany, we do have a, a law, the, the civil law uh, holds uh, paragraphs on terms of service. So if you agree to them, you are in a binding contract. Uh, why do I have tried to answer this question? Uh, there's a lot of discussions going on ever since, for example, the, the Cambridge Analytica scandal. So we're talking about post API areas, the social media platforms have, have like, put up restrictions for researchers to, to do research, to scrape uh, content, to download stuff. Uh, but it's also kind of like, as Pushman said, the end of the wild west of social media research. And then uh, this article I mentioned here, uh, Brun says like, uh, but there are a lot of researchers that uh, need access and it's actually, um, it's quite, I mean, important because a lot of things happening 
a discrimination uh, of, I don't know, the police is using your data for preventive policing, all these kind of things. So researchers, social science researchers need to have access to this data, um, although the platforms are raising the, the barriers. Um, and Bruns is pointing to the United Nations uh, fundamental uh, um, <laughs> fundamental rights, the human rights. And here you find that uh, um, research is actually one of them. And he thinks that people might want to might to want to overcome terms of service by pointing to this or like, let's say, make uh, the United Nations um, um, human rights a basis for new legislation concerning terms of service. And let's say, let's go over the the, the way on how the, the data comes about this. So you, we can f look at three scenarios here. You see the first one, consumers, they agree to, to enter on a contract with a platform. Then a researcher comes, he wants to research, do research on the customer, how the, the user is, is using the website on the platform itself. And then at the end of the food chain, as I said, are we, the, the data archive or repositories, and we actually have to go back and look at like, so what was the legal basis for your your approach? And uh, yeah, we have to face it that uh, users of platforms, they entered into a, a legally binding contract and um, they, there's an explicit agreement and there's a pro, uh, separation between user profile data and user generated context. So we, we have copyright issues, we have privacy issues here. Um, but what are the actual terms they agree to? Then the researcher comes in and uh, there are different research uh, designs they can use. For example, they can look at the users by linking uh, survey data with digital trace data to verify findings from digital trace data because they're quite unreliable. Jasmine has also pointed to this. You can look at the uh, platforms themselves, uh, talking about platform power, you know, like they are, are kind of like, as I said, it's a take it or leave it situation. Um, if you don't want our super online video uh, offer, try to find another, another platform. So people, a lot of people are bound by a small number of, of platforms. Then all this talk about algorithmic alteration of information, uh, talking about Cambridge Analytica here, or you can look at the digital trace data itself uh, as a non-intrusive measure. So people are just like tweeting, posting uh, and stuff like this. Um, how did the researchers collect the data technically? That's one issue, but what are the terms of service they have agreed to? Have they just scraped publicly available information or have they gone beyond an, uh, a lock in also agreeing to terms of service? For example, uh, uh, the Twitter case, where you can use an API to, to end, uh, access data. And then at the, uh, at the very end, uh, so what, what are this, the data that we have to take care of? No? Do we, does it contain copyright protected material like news articles, uh, images, what, uh, whatever uh, there is? Uh, does the data contain personal information? It's, it, it's almost impossible to, to anonymize um, uh, social media data because people might use, I mean, nicknames or whatever, but then they point to other people, they use those nicknames in various places. Then if you combine data sets, you might come across the actual individual behind the data. And uh, then we have to clarify what are the rights of the researcher to the data, yeah? talking about the two um, um, contracts here. So we do have this data, um, we do have the contracts, uh, we do uh, need to negotiate like what actually, what can we actually take? And in a lot of cases, we have to turn data down in the first place because it's unclear if researchers have really, I mean, some create, for example, fake uh, accounts to uh, get into touch with Facebook or other social media platform users. And that's uh, ethically uh, questionable, uh, besides the fact that it's probably a violation of, of contract here. And um, other the terms of service then binding in the full sense of the term. So there's no clear answer 
possible. I mean, because some people say like, if we, I look at certain clauses, for example, a copyright, uh, if I upload copyright protected material uh, on a platform in the United States, it, the transfer of copyrights has to be actually done in writing. So it cannot be done with a click wrap agreement. Um, and here, for example, um, I don't go into details, but one important case that's about to be decided is Sandvik versus Sessions. And it's aiming at this direction saying like, okay, but actually we are researchers. How can the commercial platform prevent our research? And there it's now, it's what's called the first uh, amendment challenge. So they say like our freedom of, of uh, um, expression is violated by the terms of services of some of the platforms. So that might be interesting in the future if this is once this is decided. And if we look at the German case, then we actually can see what it looks like if science and research is uh, protected by a constitution. So it's a constitutional right, and thus it's above commercial laws. It's above single uh, laws. And there are, uh, okay. One minute. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I'll go over this. Um, real quickly, but the rights of the individual are also protected by the Constitution, and your freedom to go into a contract is also uh, um, protected by the Constitution. So here you see that there is a, a conflict of basic rights, and that might be the. If you take the United Nations fundamental rights, um, this might be the same. Uh, if you uh, if this is set into stone in, in on a national level. Um, but these fundamental rights, uh, they are rights to protect the individual against governmental arbitrariness. So they are no offensive rights. So as a researcher in Germany, you can say like, okay, my rights are protected by the constitution. That means I overrule your terms of service. That's not, that's not, that's not doable. That's not feasible. Um, so I have to find trade-offs and settlements. Yeah. Um, you can go over this. I mean, it's, it's recorded. You get the, the slides. Uh, scraping might be one way to circumvent the terms of service, so only uh, access uh, publicly available data. So from my reading, for example, uh, you, uh, uh, the American literature is that uh, they used, there was one uh, case, HiQ versus LinkedIn, publicly available data uh, or scraped, uh, or the scraping might be legal, it's legal in the German case. Uh, but for, I mean, and the, the take home message for uh, data archives or uh, repositories is that to know how the data came about, the researchers need to preserve a copy of the terms of service. So we can always say like, hey, like, was it, for example, explicitly uh, ruled out by the platform? Okay, I hurried through this a bit. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Oliver. That was great. And we have a lot of um, good conversation happening in the chat as well. If anyone wants to ask a question of the speakers um, related to the chat, please throw it in the Q&A and we can cover that after. Um, now we'd like to get to the third presentation, which is from Verla van Eyden, who uh, joined KU Leuven uh, University in Belgium in 2020 as the research data advisor. Um, advisor RDM within its newly established research data management competency center. Um, after 12 years at the UK Data Archive. Um, she also still works one day a week as research data manager at the GCRF Drugs and Disorder Project at SOAS University of London. Um, so Verlet, please take it away. Thank you very much. So what I'm presenting here still dates from the work done at the UK Data Archive or the UK Data Service. It was due to be presented last year at iAssist. Um, and I think it's, um, still very applicable even even one year on um, um presentation was prepared together with my colleague then maureen harker at the uk data service um, so we were finding that um, the research funders in the uk had been funding a lot of uh, social science research into the global migration crisis which sort of became very uh, prominent in from 2015 um, onwards across Europe, across across much of the globe, really. Um, a lot of that research was very qualitative, um, exploring uh, what happened to migrants, their experiences, 
Um, and despite data management plans, two, three years later, when the research projects finished and data management plans indicating good intentions to archive the data, um, we were actually receiving very little data in the archive of these, what we consider to be really valuable uh, stories of the migration crisis. Because researchers perceive there be, to be ethical challenges and didn't really know how to deal with that. We know that this is uh, a complex uh, setup uh, for researchers. Uh, so research involves very vulnerable people that are on the move out of their home environment. It deals with sensitive topics. They're going through um, asylum applications at times, etc. So there's a lot of uh, complexities in this. Um, the stories uh, captured might be impossible to anonymize. Um, Discussing consent or permissions or archiving of data might be very difficult with people from different cultural backgrounds. So researchers were really uncertain how to handle this complexity and also uncertain about uh, taking responsibility for future reuses of those data. At the same time, we're talking about very valuable stories, unique resources for research and for policy also towards the future, and the realization that perhaps participants want to have their voices heard also in the future. So we organized a seminar uh, capturing testimony of the migrant crisis, November 2019, and we brought together, we tried to bring together as many stakeholders of this reality as possible. So not just the researchers, but also the research participants are the organizations acting on behalf of the research participants and also the researchers or other people that would be interested in future in using this type of data. We had 15 speakers giving presentations. Uh, we had additional participants. We kept it small because we wanted to have a very good group discussion at the end so we could come up with very tangible suggestions that would come out of this. And this was funded by UKRI through the Global Challenges Research Fund. So we had speakers on um, three different groups. We had people presenting how migration data could be used. So migration data from the past. We had speakers talking about the complexities, but also the possibilities of sharing migration data. And then we had the perspective from the researchers, uh, participants for point of view on risks, opportunities for archiving and reuse of their stories. So some of the highlights of the discussions of the day, um, it was re very interesting to hear uh, testimony from a uh, historian who was reusing data uh, now about past migration. So he in particular was looking at uh, Basque children that came to the UK in 1937. And important comments that he made was that in his research trying to uh, reconstruct uh, the the reality of 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 that situation he said that it was it was very easy to find the official voices and the official records because they had been well preserved in archive it's true meeting minutes of committees, correspondence documents report very detailed information on that official voice the voices of the children he couldn't find, they were absent. Um, he said the first, whilst research had been done with them and interviews had been done, or their stories written down, none of that material was available to him. None of that had been archived or had been kept. So the only, the earliest stories he could access dated actually from 70 years after they had first come to the UK. So he made a very strong point saying that not archiving that type of research material when it is being collected actually distorts the reality um, that, that can then later on be retraced of what happens in history. Other, other presentations from the reuse point of view looked at tools to be able to reuse qualitative data in secure environments with the demonstration of the, for example, the Claria media suit that can respect ownership and confidentiality of data and still make them available for reuse. Um, 
Then from the another highlight from the participants perspective, this was presented by we actually had one research participant presenting about that as well, but then also grassroots organizations who often act as gatekeepers who work on the ground with um, migrants and asylum seekers and who then also involve them in research or help them get involved in research who are who are the gatekeepers between researchers and the participants. And strong points that they made was that they want their contributions to have a, a long lasting effect, maybe not for themselves, but for their children, for migrants in general, for policy changes, etc. So they want researchers to pursue impact with their research and to make their findings applicable um in in towards the future and 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 they also indicated strongly that researchers aren't neutral can't be neutral in this type of research there was also the case made for participants to be partners in the research not to be the research subjects so to have a co-creation of knowledge a co-production of testimonies so that the ownership changes from the researcher to actually the the, the participants and they indicated that the voices need to be heard. And a, a, an example, for example, is there's a link there also, one of the uh, organizations um, participating, making, making video films with uh, anonymous people, but with real testimonies and stories co-produced by um, actually assignment seekers and migrants. From a policy and advocacy point of view, the, the case was made that sharing data, sharing testimonies can be important as well because case studies are needed for policy, for decision making. Um, it's often difficult for um, charities to have access to those stories or they might be asked by policymakers to have case studies contributed, which might put a, a, a burden on the on the little resources that they have to work with participants. So again, they, they highlighted the need that sharing archive data early within a secure setting can actually facilitate facilitate that use of information in policy. Some of the recommendations that came out of it, when we look at it from a data archiving point of view and future uses, um, it was interesting to have these different um, opposites, almost the researchers with their concerns, but then also the strong voices for the participants and, and researchers engaging in participatory research, showing alternatives uh, that they were applying. So the fact that long term embargoes can be very useful in archiving that type of material because time means sensitivity, confidentiality reduces, uh, makes reuse easier in future. Um, also the highlight that future use of, of, of that type of information gathered in research is often very different from the current. So the concern that researchers have of taking that responsibility for what's going to happen with, uh, with the information is that often future users might not be interested in the confidentiality or the sensitivity, might be interested in other aspects of the data. Uh, it might be used in teaching, it might be used in, in identity construction, nation building, etc. And these are uh, issues that, that are important for researchers to keep in mind as well. And that there is asp aspects in which the anonymization can be helped. Vignettes were, were highlighted or pseudonyms, for example. From a methodology point of view, there was actually a strong case made for um, some of the grassroots organizations, the gatekeepers sort of making strong voices saying, why, why do researchers use interviews? Because interviews are so loaded to migrants and to asylum seekers because they are being interviewed by officials for their asylum application. They're being interviewed by researchers, often by multiple research projects, uh, etc. So it becomes confusing uh, for, for participants to be to have these multiple interviews for different purposes and they might not understand it. And it, it can lead to rehearsed interviews being given to researchers so that it aligns with their asylum stories. Um, 
Alternatives were proposed by uh, uh, some of the presenters there to look at more participant-centered methodologies, co-creation, co-ownership, uh, participatory documentaries, citizen science methodologies, etc. Um, and also a strong case made for researchers allowing time and space to engage and communicate with their participants about these important aspects of ownership, what happens to the future of that information, rather than often not not having time in the research to be able to do that and then at the end panicking and, and then sort of going oh we can't archive that because it's so sensitive and we haven't really taken the time to discuss that with with our participants and then from an ethical point of view the notification that often the standard ethics procedures are not very suitable in these types of circumstances when you're working in in different cultures or in complex circumstances um, it, ethics committees might not provide meaningful information of how you communicate uh, this with participants, um, informed consent may be meaningless in cultures or situations, etc., especially where there's a strong push towards written consent forms, um, for example. Um, so for researchers to be more explicit in explaining how data might be used in future, um, and, and also highlighting the value of those stories beyond the research towards other purposes as well in uh, future important aspect that came out was that researchers whilst they might want to be neutral and say that they are neutral in research and they only do the research participants were strong in that saying well they can't be neutral because participants will always hope that they benefit from participating uh, in in the research and sharing data can in a way maybe facilitate this um, in that it opens up more opportunities for the data, the information to be applied and for change to take place. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so if you have any questions for any of the presenters, please throw them in the Q&A. Um, and I think we'll start with um, the first question, which is for everyone. Uh, question for all, um, do your recommendations change for formal research versus more exploratory projects, um, data, viz, um, et cetera? What is meant by data viz? I mean, is that uh, uh, data viz visualization? Visualization, <laughs> but so I, I, the exploration versus the the <laughs> the more standard research. Then is that what's meant? Uh, it doesn't change. I mean, it, the the point, for example, with social media data, is that people were just eager to get their hands on the data because it's so easily accessible. Uh, you get large amounts of data. You get millions of participants. Uh, you can do whatever, uh, yeah. That's what that was. That's what happened, and uh, this is why uh, Pushman talked about this end of the wild west. Yeah, it's, this uh, metaphor was not uh, used for no reason because, uh, or used for a good reason because people just scraped and downloaded whatever was was uh, in their in their reach. And um, the point is that we're now looking at, uh, let's say we're moving toward best practices. Um, and um, some of my colleagues, one of the departments of Gizes is on computational social sciences, and they are uh, exploring new ways of, for example, data donations, going out for consent, actually asking people. Uh, people then are quite, quite reluctant. And as research shows, um, people are not aware that their data is being used for research, actually. But then quality research and uh, from the survey field shows that if you involve people and you tell them, OK, so we're doing decent research, we are not some, I don't know, strange institutions from institution from some strange place, somewhere remote, um, and we want to sell your data or we want to do anything that the platform actually does. Um, I think that's a way forward. So there's probably going to be some uh, uh, how do you say this? Uh, it's uh, the, the this diffusion phase, so it becomes more common, and I think thus will uh, the the ways of, for example, asking for consent and uh, 
getting to the real data, combining it with our data sources to to verify the data and stuff like this. So the, it, uh, it's the same for both sides. But of course, like uh, if you uh, go into a new method, you want to explore it and you want to be first on the on the market. So. Jasmine or Verla, any comments? I mean, I think uh, so for leaked data sets, uh, journalists have more, and journalism has a little more wiggle room than academic research. That would be the comment I make there. And then, but uh, yeah, overall, it's like you can mess around, like you can go try it, but like if you find something and then you can't use it, I don't know if that's the best use of your time. I, I don't know. It really depends. Um, sorry for not a better answer there. And I think in my case, um, probably not a lot. I guess the the diff the, the the difference the important difference might be that in what you, what you might call formal research, possibly where, where you apply a structured approach to the research, possibly the resources that are created there are even more valuable than than what you might indicate to be exploratory uh, projects or research, but. Um, the interesting part of the, 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 the having the different stakeholders at the seminars was that, to, to see that also charities for the work that they do or grassroots organizations who work with migrants, they also do their research, they also need information and data, so they do small um, case studies maybe, but equally these are valuable, valuable resources on which policy is based or, or on which important decisions are based. Great, we have another question for Virla. Um, Virla, it sounds like there is a core set of principles that apply to the projects you described and to other research that involves communities, such as indigenous groups, um, as far as data ownership, participatory roles, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that was the 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 the, the highlight probably of what came out of the 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 day in that we we probably we'd set out to sort of come up with practical ethical guidance and it's 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 really a lot broader it's it's sort of good good research practices of how you can probably do better research better work with vulnerable groups in your research by also changing your your approaches maybe your methodologies to work in a, in a more um, harmonious way or um, participatory way with with communities that that is equally important to to consider which would equally be applicable to to um, yeah indigenous communities to to sort of have that have that respect um, move away from the the studied uh, subjects to to that co-creation or co-ownership of information great there's um a link in the q a um i'm not sure who posted it but Perhaps you want to post that in the, the chat for the panelists and the attendees to see. I'm not sure if everyone can see the Q&A um, or I can copy it over. Uh, sorry, I am going to paste that into the chat there. Um, we are coming close to time. So uh, I just want to make sure that we end so that everyone can get to the next session. There is some great discussion happening in the chat. I encourage you to start a thread in the community discussion board to continue this if that's something of interest to you. And otherwise, thank you so much for attending and look forward, look forward to seeing you at the next sessions. Um, thanks, Jasmine, Oliver, and Vail. Thank you, thank Dylan. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.